Sisters and welcome to today's Grade 11 Physical Sciences show. Today we have a special revision lesson on refraction and diffraction. We have selected highlights from lessons shown early in the term to help you revise and prepare for your June exams. You can download the notes for today's show from learnextra.co.za forward slash live. Now it's time to get on with today's lesson. Please post your comments and questions on our Facebook page on facebook.com forward slash learn extra or on Twitter at learn extra so we can help you with your revision. And I'm going to do a little demonstration. We'll, we'll do this quickly and then we'll do one, one more example in a, in a second. Have we got time for this, Megan? Yeah, definitely. Go for it. Okay. Right. So let's go. If we take a block now, let's say that this is a glass block. And I want to show you the effect of refraction. So this is a glass block. And we're going to say here is some air. Now, let's be very clear. We're going to say there's a beam of light traveling in. Guys, beam of light, you can do this for yourself. You can take your torch. You can get a block of glass or block of perspex. Take your torch and cut a cardboard shape to it. So it's just a thin little beam that travels through the cardboard. Put the cardboard, uh, sellotape it on top of the, the torch and allow the little beam to go through. Make it a dark room or do it at night time and you'll see the beam of light travels through the block. Now, if the beam of light is put at this angle, at 90 degrees to the surface, the beam of light will in fact just go straight through it. But what I want you to understand is that there is still a change of speed here. Here it was traveling in air, here it's traveling in glass, and it slows down because the particles uh, are closer together. So it slows down here, and here it goes back to air. So it was traveling slowly, it will speed up. This change of going from fast to slow to fast again is called refraction. Now, when we have a line like that, a beam of light that is at an angle like that one, then there is an additional effect we will see that the beam of light doesn't go straight through. Uh, it will bend. And that's what you need to be able to explain. The bending of light when it travels through a transparent object. Now, depending on uh, how those particles are packed together will depend on the degree and the amount of refraction that takes place. A person that described that was a man called Snell developed Snell's law, which we'll come into uh, a little later. But this is more as important as Snell's law. I want you to get this right, because then you can do the calculations. Drawing the diagrams first is the most important thing. Now, we have an angle of uh, a normal, like we had with reflection, that is at 90 degrees to the surface, and we'll call that the normal not a very straight line, but I just want to put it there as a dotted line for the moment so that we can see it like that. So we have a normal, and this angle here between the normal and the incident ray, this is the incident ray, so this is going to be the incident angle, the angle of incidence. Now, if the glass block is not very shiny, then you'll find that most of the light will continue into the block. If the glass block is shiny, we might get some reflection at the surface. Let's pretend that there's no reflection. We're going to say that all of the light carries on into the block. What's going to happen? On this side, on the glass side of the block here, we find a very interesting observation. What happens is that the beam of light bends, and it bends in a very special way. Because it's moving from going fast to going slow, it bends towards the normal. Let me show you that. 
it doesn't carry on in the direction it was going to go. It doesn't continue on the yellow line. That doesn't happen. Okay? But it has actually bent towards the normal. In other words, it's made an angle here that's smaller. It's bent closer to the dotted white line. This angle now between the normal and the green line, the normal and the green line is called theta r. Theta r is the angle of refraction. Okay, guys? So let's c cover this carefully. If an object, if light is moving into a transparent object, strikes it and is refracted, and it slows down, then the beam of light will bend towards the normal. Very important. What you'll notice is you've got to be able to draw this diagram very carefully. It went angle of incidence, didn't carry on going on the dotted yellow line, but it bent towards the normal. The angle of theta is not the same as the angle of refraction. The angle of incidence here is much larger. The angle of incidence, uh, the refraction is smaller, smaller than the angle of incidence. So bear in mind that's what's happening. When it's going from fast then the ang to slow, the angle of incidence will be greater than the angle of refraction. And again, I know it's confusing because there's an R here and there was an R in uh, reflection, but we need to understand that very carefully. I think we're coming up for a break, but while you go to the break, what I want you to do is ask yourself, what happens when this beam of light strikes this surface here at the bottom? I'm going to highlight it in pink. Okay? So when the, when the light beam is going from glass to air, what do you think is going to happen now? When it's slowed down, it moved towards the normal. What do you think is going to happen? See if you can draw it. Just get a sketch out. See if you can draw what happens. Remember, we're dealing with that glass block, and we're going from glass into air. And what we're saying is here it was slow and here it was f it's faster. Light is able to travel at different speeds. Uh, what's going to happen? In the same way as we did before, we're going to draw in the normal. At 90 degrees, let's just get that a little bit straighter. Uh, this one at least. And I'm going to just erase it a little bit so that we've got it more dotted. And I'm just drawing it freehand at the moment. If you had a ruler, you'd be able to draw it much more accurately. Now, this angle inside the green block, uh, inside the glass block, is still known as the angle of incidence. Wherever there's a, a medium, a change in medium, a barrier, this is the change in medium, then there's an angle of incidence. Light is striking, that light ray is striking at that position. What's going to happen? I want you to notice that it will not carry on in the same direction. So it's not going to carry on down there like that. Uh, we know that that's not going to be the case. What's going to happen? And I like to put that line in, use a ruler and draw a dotted line in, because that's where we might expect, if there was no barrier, that's where we would expect the light to travel. If there was no surface, there's no interface between glass and air, we would expect the light to carry on going straight. Now there's a barrier. It's not going to do that. It's going to speed up. So what does it do? It bends away from the normal. So instead of going there, it's actually now increased its size. So can you see here that the angle of refraction, theta r, is going to be greater than the angle of incidence. Now, we've spelt out these laws of reflection in detail in our notes. So please make sure you understand the drawings and you understand the statement. I'm not going to go over those, but just understand them. When we're moving from 
air to glass, where the particles are closer together, we sometimes say that's optically more dense. And it's a very loose expression. We'll come to define that more definitely uh, a little later. I do want to do one more example just to illustrate it very quickly. Um, but what we will say is that there's a refractive index where light travels slowly, fast, uh, it will bend towards or away. You need to make sure if it's moving from slow to fast, it bends away. When it's moving from fast to slow, it bends towards. Make sure you understand uh, how we're indicating this angle that is increasing and this angle that's getting smaller. One last thing. For a prism like this rectangular block, where the light sides are parallel to each other, then the incident ray and the reflected, uh, the, re the final emerging ray will be parallel to each other. When the sides are parallel, then the rays will be parallel. Okay, guys, I hope you're enjoying this revision session. If you are struggling and need help, remember to post on the page or send an email to helpdesk at learnextra.co.za. Now it's time for a break, so don't go away. We'll be right back. Welcome back, guys. I hope you are getting into the idea of revision. Please let us know how you are doing. I'd love to chat to you on the page or on Twitter. Enough of the chat. Let's get back to revision now. Thank you for me. <laughs> Enthusiastic. <laughs> anyway, I like that. Okay, so let's do some questions with cells and all because you're going to get these, okay? Unfortunately, and as much as we hate the trig, it's okay. The nice thing about Snell's Law is they really can only ask you in a couple of ways, which is brilliant. So they say to you that a, okay, let me just extend it this way. Uh, light is passed from air into a rectangular glass prism. Now, in the question, I didn't give you the refractive index because it's actually in the notes if you don't know them and stuff. But in a test or an exam, you've got to be given the refractive index if you're not working it out. So, in other words, either somewhere in the question, which you'll see in the second question, we've got to state that the refractive index is whatever it happens to be, or there has to be a table with the refractive indexes on you do not need to learn them. The only one you really need to remember is the fact that the refractive index of A is 1. The rest, you, need, you should be given those refractive indexes. And in fact, for glass, we're going to use the refractive index of 1,5. Okay? Now they say, what angle of incidence? So I'm asking for theta i. Get, would give an angle of refraction... Okay, theta r of 10 degrees. Now, unfortunately, sometimes you are going to have to work out the angle. Last, in the last section, before the break, we worked out the refractive index. Nice thing is, we use Snell's law. So, n1 sine theta i equals n2 sine theta R and it started in air, so that's my initial refractive index. We don't know what theta i is, so let's... Okay, Ooh, that doesn't even look like an i anymore. Sorry about that. I would moan at my children, so let's write this properly. There we go. And the refractive index for glass is one and a half, and it has an angle, an angle of in incident of refraction of sine 10 degrees. Okay. Now we need theta i. So first let's get sine theta on its own. So sine theta here. We would divide both sides by 1. So it's actually quite nice because divide by 1, it's the same. Okay. So we have 1 and a half sine 10 degrees. Now this is not a maths exam. Okay, in maths, because you're working out an angle, you would now need to use arc sine and sine to the minus one and write down all that. We don't care. We're just going to be able to use our calculators and get to what sine, what theta is. Okay, so if we look at our calculators, because I think it's really important you know how to do it. Okay, let's just put the calculator over here so we've got the sum in front of us. So, to find the angle, we need to use second function 
sine. Okay, so it must say sine to the minus 1. Now it's inside a bracket, and we can say, well, what it meant is we need to go, I'm going to open another bracket, 1 and a half, which is how I wrote it, times sine, 10 degrees. Okay, now I'm going to close my echo bracket, and I'm going to press equal. Okay, and we get, let me just check, we get 15,09. And some of you are going, that just sounds like such a funny number. It is. It's okay. Okay. Oh, look, it's disappeared. So we get 15,09. It's, let's just check back again there. It's 15,098. Remember, it's got to be two decimal places. So the 8 would make the 9 move. So it's going to be 15,1 15, 15, degrees. Okay. So we're going to do another one just to make sure that you can actually set it out. So it's the, same, it's the same concept, but now, instead of 10 degrees, we're going to use 36. Same, same, same process, okay? So we have sine theta. We're going to do n2, sine theta 2. N is 1. We like it when they do that because it makes our lives so much easier. And this is 1 and a half. That's what we did in the last one. And sine 36 degrees. Now remember, I can divide both sides by 1, so that gives me sine theta for my incident ray on its own. So let's get theta, okay, because that's what we want. If you want to set it out the way you would in maths, please do that. If it makes it easier for you, you're welcome to do that grade 11s, okay? I just know that for some of you, you can't remember and it stresses you out, it's fine, okay, as long as you remember how to use your calculator. So, Let's do this one again. I want sine theta, so let's go through it again. Okay, let me put that here. So, shift, sine, okay. Then I'm going to put the one and a half in a bracket like it's written, okay. Then I'm going to put, and it's going to be times sine 36. And then I close my bracket again, and I go equal, and I get 61. That's not what I was supposed to get. Ah, okay. I'm hoping there's someone watching the show right now who's going, Tracy, maybe you should read the question. Because okay. now I'm looking at my notes and going, I didn't get that answer. Because if we look at the question, what's the difference? What did I do wrong? The angle of incidence is 36 degrees, not the angle of refraction. So, that means, because I'm thinking that's a very strange angle of refraction. It was way too big. So, that is incorrect. Um, let's actually make this, can I make this a bit bigger? Okay. So, let's start again, shall we? And grade 11s, this is just to prove to you we're all human. Especially teachers. That, well, not really, but we pretend. But we all make mistakes, okay? And please, if you're going to, to get big angles like that, and that's what made me think, okay, there's something wrong here. That was a very big angle. We don't normally use angles like that, okay? So we know that that's 1. This is going to be sine 36 degrees. This is N 1.5, okay? We, sorry, that should be sine R as well. So we don't want... We want sine th um, theta r on its own, so we're going to divide both sides by one and a half. One times sine 36 is going to be sine 36. Okay. And we're going to divide this by one and a half. So, my angle of refraction. Let's do the calculator again, okay? So, we're going to use second function sine just like we did the last time. Now we're going to put in what we want, what's going to go inside. So it's going to be sine 36. Remember to close the bracket on the 36. 
so that your calculator knows that's the angle. Okay, so we'll, ca we'll calculate sine 36. Now we're going to divide by 1.5, close our brackets, and we're going to go, okay, much better. And we get 23,7 degrees. Okay, much better angle. Makes more sense now. You guys okay with that? I know this is just a practice thing, and really it's about your calculator work. If you're not confident, grade 11s, please remember that getting to the point where you need to get the final answer, your final answer is worth one mark. Everything else up to there, that's where all the science takes place. Okay? And in fact, this first line is the science. That's what I'm looking for. That's what I really want to know you understand. Okay, so let's move on. And we're going to go to total internal reflection just quickly. You have all experienced total internal reflection at some stage, okay? Best example is when you're looking at a pool or you're looking at a lake and you're looking at a body of water and it looks like, it almost looks like a mirror, especially if it's a nice calm day and there's no waves and the water's nice and calm and, and it starts to look silver along the top you're starting to see total internal reflection, okay, which is so, so exciting. But total internal reflection can only happen when light is moving from an optically dense medium, like water, for example, to a lower optical dense, like air, okay? Because when my, when my light ray moves from water to air, it gets refracted away from the normal. So we start and we say, here we go. I'm going to use, my light ray comes in here, and it refracts away from the normal, okay? If I increase the angle of incidence, so now I do it again, and I say, well, let's make the angle of incidence here, okay? My light ray actually refracts a little bit more. So it starts to bend further and further and further away. Eventually, we get a situation where my angle of incidence here is, set, is a sp very specific angle, which, we, which then means, which then results in my, ang my light ray being refracted along the surface, the boundary, okay? This angle, this angle here is known as the critical as the critical angle. Every single substance has a different critical angle. Diamonds have a very small critical angle. So what happens is often the light gets to this section and then the light rays go against the surface, which is why they shimmer. But what happens when my angle of incidence is greater than this critical angle? In other words, I bring my light ray here. Now it's greater than this angle of incidence. Remember, it's already refracted as much as it can go. It's refracted at 90 degrees, okay? It cannot refract anymore. There's only one place for this light to go, and that is for it to come back in. It now gets reflected. And all the laws we know about reflection, in other words, this angle of incidence will be equal to that angle of, of reflection, okay? So, what does that mean for us? And so, last thing, and then we'll go to a break. Two things need to happen. Number one, the light ray must go from a greater optical density to a lower optical density. Water to air, glass to air, something like that, okay? And number two, the angle of incidence must be greater than the critical angle. Okay, and the critical angle is set. It's like the refractive index. You do not need to know what those are. They will be given to you if you need them. Okay, you don't need to know them. And if it's greater than the critical angle, gets reflected back in, okay, and the angle of reflection equals the angle of incidence. It's the same as if you go swimming, and sometimes I'm sure you've looked up, if you ap open your eyes underwater, which I struggle with, but if you look up underwater, sometimes you can't actually see the sky because of the angle of in the reflection of the light coming back in. Okay, so it makes life 
can be quite interesting underwater for looking at things like that, okay? Now it's time for a break, so don't go away. We'll be right back. Welcome back from the break. I know you can't wait for the term to end and the July holidays to start. And of course, that means winter school. This year, we will be repeating all the term two Learn Extra live shows for you from the 24th till the 28th of June, from 9 a.m. in the morning till 7 p.m. at night. So don't miss out. Go to our website, www.mindset.co.za forward slash learn, forward slash extra, forward slash winter school to get all the details and to download the notes for each lesson. But for now, let's get back to today's revision lesson. Over to you. And I'd like to kick off with this particular one here. Question number one. And it just takes us into a question about reflection. And it is important that we understand this. It says, a light beam strikes a plane mirror. That just means it's a flat mirror. It's not bent, curved, because then something else would happen. This is a flat mirror, a plane mirror. The light beam strikes it so that the angle of incidence is 30 degrees. What will be the angle? Now listen to me carefully here. We've got to check the angle of incidence is 30 degrees. What they're asking is what is the angle between the mirror and the reflected ray? And you've got to show it on a diagram. So let's do that. Let's get it clear and let's make sure that we've got it right. So I'm going to use this straight line as the shiny surface of the mirror. I'm then going to say to myself, okay, let's take another line, and I just want to change the color of it quickly uh, and make it white so that we can see it a little bit better, and that's fine. Let's check it now, make sure that we've got a white beam going in like that. Okay, this beam is going to be called our incident ray. And we know that it's heading towards the mirror. The yellow thing is the mirror. Light isn't going to go through it. Remember, a mirror is a shiny surface. It's going to reflect all the light. So the light comes in and it's reflected. Very good. You got that. It's not going to pass through the mirror. It's going to bounce off the mirror. We'll show you that in a minute. Next thing, we need to draw in our normal. Remember, the normal is the line that is at 90 degrees to the mirror's surface. And it is always drawn at 90 degrees, and it strikes at the point of incidence. So we're going to just move it over there. That's the incident ray. I want to just move this one over just a little bit so it is in line at the intersection with the incident ray and the mirror. Now what happens? Well, the law of reflection says that the angle of incidence is equal to the angle of reflection. So, if this angle is 30 degrees, this angle is 30 degrees, then where is the reflected ray going to go? Well, the reflected ray is going to start at this point here, and it's going to go at the same angle away from the mirror. Now, I, I'm not measuring this. I'm just doing it roughly. But what we need to recognize is that the angle of incidence is equal to the angle of reflection. This is the angle, theta r, for reflection. This is theta i for incidence. And for reflection, we know that theta incident is equal to theta r reflected. Now, does that explain the question? Is that what they're looking for? No, let's go back and read the question, because this is a trick question. Let's have a look. What does it say? It says, please find the angle between the mirror and the reflected ray. So here's the mirror, and here's the reflected ray. So that's the angle we're looking at. We're not looking at the angle of reflection. So what we've got to do is we've got to remember that the normal 
is an angle of 90 degrees. That's right angles. It's perpendicular to the surface. So this angle that we're looking for, the green one, I've indicated there, is going to be 90 minus theta r. So we're going to say theta is equal to 90 degrees minus theta r. So that's going to be 90 degrees minus 30 degrees. So the answer that we're looking for is 60 degrees, the angle between the mirror and the reflected ray. Okay, guys, that's been a very quick revision of reflection. Don't forget reflection. You could get asked on it. Guys, I've got a little laser pointer, <laughs> and I want to use it to, to show you what's going to happen. Now, a laser pointer uh, emits a little red beam of light, and maybe you can see it flashing off my hand there. Okay? Um, now, the angle at which it bounces off objects uh, will allow us to show different aspects of ha what happens when light bounces off different objects. And that's exactly the question we've got here. Notice what it says. It says what we're asked to do is to state the three things that could happen when a ray of light, beam of light, when it falls on an object. Well, it depends on what type of object. So let's just get to our correct piece of uh, information there. Uh, it depends on what sort of object we've got. So if we've got a mirror here, now what I'm going to do is I'm going to take my little uh, laser pointer and I'm going to shine it in a particular direction. So I'm going to shine it onto the, the, la onto the mirror and I'm going to reflect it onto Pumi's shirt over there. Okay. So we're not standing in a straight line, but you can see it falling from the mirror okay. and it's bouncing onto her shirt. That's exactly what we were doing. There's another thing here. We say that when light falls then on an object, it can be reflected. There's another one here. It's a little magnifying glass. Let me put the mirror away. I'll come back to the mirror in a minute. We take the magnifying glass and we put the light beam on it. Then what we'll see is the light beam travels through and you'll see it reflecting onto or bouncing onto the, the top of the board here, onto the black section of the board. It's got a little bit smaller. I can even do that and make it go on to Chipomi's uh, shirt as well in a straight line this time. The light has traveled through the magnifying glass, through the lens, and you've been able to see the little red dot. This little pointer is producing some li red light, which you can see on my, shirt, uh, on my hand over there. I don't want to point it into the camera, but they have fun to play with. Now, what's the third thing? So light can pass through or it can undergo reflection. It was the first one when it fell onto the mirror. So it can undergo reflection, can be reflected. It can pass through an object. It, we say that when it does that and it passes through a material that's transparent or sl even slightly opaque, then it is undergoing refraction because it's changing its speed. It's slowing down. Or if it's going from a, a dense medium, optically dense medium, to a, a less optically dense medium, it will speeding up. So it can undergo refraction. It can be reflected. It can be refracted. Better to say refracted. And what's the third thing? Well, guys, this is important. We had a long discussion about this when I was with you two weeks ago. We said that objects that are dark in color, black objects, they absorb light. Now, the same goes for colored materials. They absorb certain frequencies of light and they reflect the ones that we see. So reflection, uh, reflect, uh, light can be refracted, it can be reflected, and it can be absorbed. So light falling onto a black object, all the light is absorbed, all the frequencies of light are absorbed, and we don't see any reflection. When something falls onto a blue object, only the blue light is reflected. All the other colors, all the other frequencies of light are absorbed. Okay, so I think that covers that section. 
Let's now make sure that we get Snell's law and the idea of refractive index sorted out. So here's the question. See if you can work along with me because we're going to do quite a number of these calculations. Uh, we've got a whole lot. Make sure you download the notes. They're on the Learn Extra page on the uh, www.learnextra.co.za forward slash live. Go and download them. Make sure you work through them. So what does it say? It says light is shone through a sapphire. Calculate the speed of light when, travel, when light travels through the sapphire. Now, guys, we can't do this unless we get the refractive index. What information are we given? Let's write down. We know that the refractive index, N, is equal to C divided by V. And what they want us to do is they want to calculate the speed of light. This is the V part. Now, we know that C is the speed of light in a vacuum. It's 3 times 10 to the 8 meters per second. But what we need now is to find the refractive index of sapphire. Now, if you remember, we had a whole table of them. I've just made a copy of that table. Let's go and have a look if we can find sapphire on it. There it is, right at the bottom. Sapphire is 1,6. 1,76. 1,76. Pumi, will you remember that for me? Yeah. 1,76 if I need it. So the refractive index of sapphire was 1,76. Okay. Now, guys, what we're wanting to do is to find V. V is our unknown. V, remember, is the speed of light through the sapphire. That's exactly what we want to find. So how are we going to go about it? This is how I always work. I say, we've got a formula, can get it on the data sheet, substitute into the formula. Don't mess around. If you try and change the formula and you make a mistake, then you're not going to get your marks for substitution. Substitute in first and then solve. So, let's substitute. Here we go. We're going to say the refractive index of sapphire, 1,76. What was the speed of light? 3 times 10 to the 8 meters per second. You must learn that. It's on the data sheet, but you must learn it as well. And we want to find V. That's what we're looking for. So we can now, having substituted, recognize, multiply both sides by V, and then say, divide by the refractive index. So it's 3 times 10 to the 8 meters per second, divided by 1,76, I'm going to need a calculator to do that, and my calculator has disappeared, so let me quickly get it up. Um, it's just going to take a second. There's my calculator. Quick dash to try and get it. Um, we just simply plug the values into the calculator, and we'll make sure that we get the right answer. Are we ready to get the calculator? There we go. We're not going to worry. There's my calculator, and we're going to put the values in. Three exponent 8 divided by 1,76 equals, and that's a really big number, but I must write it in scientific notation. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to divide this by uh, 1 times 10 to the 8 because I can count the number of, of uh, places there. 1 times 10 to the 8 and if you then look at the answer, you will get it as a fraction 1,70 times 10 to the 8. 1,70 times 10 to the 8. So make sure you're with that. You've got that sorted out. 1,70 times 10 to the 8. We don't want to meters per second. Guys, it's not going to be less than times 10 to the 8. We need to make sure it's very unlikely that it's going to be very much smaller than that. The refractive index wasn't that high. So we can predict, yeah, we think that that's about right. If it was 2, the refractive index was 2, then we know that the speed of light is going to be about half of what it was before uh, in a vacuum. So that's how I know that this is about the right value because it's close to where we, where we were with a refractive index 
of 1,76, um, we are just about there. We're in the right region. Okay, make sure you don't make a mistake. Calculate carefully and get your answer correct. Working with scientific notation isn't easy, and it's something that you're going to need to practice. Let's move on, and let's see what our next calculation is. Okay, here we go. This one tells us something a little bit more. It says, when light moves from glass to diamond, will the speed increase, decrease, or stay the same? Give a reason for your answer by referring to the refractive index and the optical density of each medium. Okay, so guys, that's really important. We've got to take the data and look at them very carefully. So let's go to our table. We want the refractive index of glass and diamond. Where's our table of refractive indices? There they are. And I can see diamond over here. Diamond at a value of 2,42. And glass, where's glass? 1,52. So glass is 1,52 and diamond is 2,52. So let me write that down. Uh, 2,42 for diamond. So refractive index of diamond Two comma five two. I th okay, let's just check it. Four two. Thank you. Uh, I wasn't listening very carefully. I didn't remember that. Make sure that it, you write it down correctly. So diamond is two comma four two. What about glass? So we need the refractive index of glass. Check it on the table, and there it is. One comma four five two. That's where I was making. The distinction, 1,52. So guys, let's make sure we understand what this is meaning. Which one is going to slow the light down the most? Remember, the higher the refractive index, the slower the light will travel. So immediately we can see that here is where the light is going to be slowest. Slowest. And here, it's going to be slightly faster. It's going to be faster, but slower than in a vacuum. So slower, this one is going to be fast, this one is going to be slowest. Got it? What do we have to do? It's moving from glass to diamond. So it's going from fast to slowest. What's happening? Is it increasing, decreasing, or staying the same? Now, I think we can definitely say that this is going to decrease. So the speed of light decreases. And why? Because it's moving from, because the optical density in glass is less than the optical density in diamond. Sorry, the refractive index. The refractive index of glass is less than the refractive index of diamond. And we can say that the, it is optically, because we have to do density, optically, optically less dense to optically more dense. Diamond is more dense, more dense. Okay, got it? Make sure that you understand what's happening when light changes and moves into different medium, it's going to change its speed. That's what refraction is all about. Now, the other effect is that light, when it's refracted, changes direction. Okay, guys, I hope you're enjoying this revision session. If you are struggling and need help, remember to post on the page or send an email to helpdesk at learnextra.co.za. Now it's time for a break, so don't go away. We'll be right back. Welcome back, Mindsetters. Today we are doing revision. 
even though we are selecting highlights from previous shows, you can still follow me on Twitter at Learn Extra or post or comment on our Facebook page, facebook.com forward slash Learn Extra. Right now, let's do some more revision. Now, when we look at water waves, now this is actually a great picture. And in fact, if you go into Google Earth and you go anywhere along our coast where we've got nice um, beaches and jetties and stuff, you see this really nicely. Now, this picture is great because this shows a water wave. It shows a very clear wave front, which is the white part, comes to a barrier. And look what happens to the wave. It bends, okay? Now you're saying to yourself, hang on, wait. But Tracy, you just did an experiment with light, which went through a slit, but it didn't bend per se. Well, think about what was happening, okay? I shone a very thin beam of light, okay? It's thin, thin, thin. It's a laser, okay? In fact, I think if I put it onto the screen, you can see very briefly, though I'm sure my director, you see it's very thin. Thin, thin laser light, okay? That tiny little pinpoint light gave us a wide pattern, okay? And in fact, the pattern was probably about five centimeters wide. So now you've got to say, Jeff, hang on, what do we know about light? Light travels in straight lines, okay? So how did I make this tiny little pinprick get wider? By putting it through the slit. That is diffraction because what's happening, okay, is the wave is bending, okay? So this wave is now spreading out as it goes out, okay? This is a water wave. Water waves are transverse waves. Light waves are transverse waves. If it can happen with water, it can happen with light, okay? So be careful here, all right? Now, Let's try and explain it. And this is where Huygens principle is very, very important. I'm going to go through this very slowly, okay? We have over here my original so wave front. Whatever that wave front may be, okay? Light, water, whatever, okay? The wave moves, gets to the barrier. This is my barrier, which was the other side of the mirror of the slit, okay? Then it gets to the slit. Part of the wave gets to the slit, moves to the front of the slit, okay? Some of it will get reflected. We're okay with that. Gets to the, to the slit. And now what happens is, remember, we've got a new wave front over here. On that wave front, there are lots of little secondary sources, okay? Huygens principle. Secondary sources. Those secondary sources now create new waves, which move out in circles. Okay? So I just want to make this a little thinner. Um, all right, I want to go there. Just, oh, okay. It's just a bit easier. So now this creates a new wave front, a new wave front, a new wave front, a new wave front, new wave front, new wave front. New wave front, okay? Not exactly in line with the source, but it's okay. But this is circular. This circular wave front now gets bigger and goes here. It's starting to bend. Gets bigger and comes here. Gets bigger, goes here. And it moves out. What has happened? This straight wave, this little point over here, has created a wave that now is going upwards. It's changing direction, okay? Here, this, this one at the bottom, if we create the wave that just gets bigger and bigger, and this is actually, this diagram is quite clear in the notes. Oh, wait, look at that. It fills up all the space. So now we've got this new wave front that has waves that are traveling there and there. We've bent the wave around the, the barrier, okay? So we've bent it. So that's exactly what happens with light. Whether it's a thin light, thick light, whatever it is, when it gets to a barrier like this, it can bend around the barrier because of the new sources, which is why Huygens' principle is so important to us. Because remember, when 
we ha if we have to draw the same for all of them, it's just going to get messy. We join all the wave fronts together, okay? And that creates the new wave front, which then bends because of the, the slit. How much it bends depends on a couple of things, which we will discuss in a second, okay? So how much it, how much it bends is set. So it's not an arbitrary thing. It's not a case of, oh, well, it feels like today when it goes to the splits, splits it's, it's going to bend a little bit, and then tomorrow it's going to bend a little, little bit less. You know, it's not like us. There's set rules to how much it's going to bend and what the maximum it can bend and the minimum, okay? Obviously, the minimum means it doesn't bend at all, so pretty much it's not going through a slit. But as soon as it goes through any sort of slit barrier, past a barrier, okay, it bends. Might only bend a little bit. This is actually not a lot of diffraction on this particular diagram. Might bend a lot. Why does it bend? And I know I'm repeating myself, but it's really, really important. Because wave front, the wave front has a whole bunch of point sources in it, okay, which are our secondary sources. Those secondary sources create new wave fronts, which are circular. If we then join all our wave fronts together like Huygens' principle says to us we must, we get a new wave front which shows how it bends. Okay? And that's how I can take a thin, thin point laser and create a wide pattern which is about five centimeters long. Okay? And I think, no, let's do this quickly and then we'll take a break. So I said to you how much it depends, depend, bends depends on the slit. Okay? So it's really easy to remember. If it's a wide opening, Little bending, wide opening, very little diffraction. Small opening, lots of diffraction, okay? So the smaller the opening, the more it bends, okay? And in fact, that's what's happening with the laser, is the laser is going through a very tiny little slit, which then creates this big pattern around it, okay? Big pattern around it, very important. Lots of bending. Okay, I'm hoping we're getting this. Wide slit, very little bending, very little diffraction. Small slit, lots of bending, lots of diffraction. Okay, and in fact, to get this maximum diffraction, this slit cannot be smaller than the wavelength. As soon as it's smaller than the wavelength, it's, well, we reflect it. As soon as it's bigger than the wavelength, we get less than maximum. Maximum diffraction happens when the slit width is the same length as the wavelength of the wave that's going towards the barrier. Okay. We've come to the end of today's show. Thanks to Macmillan for making the show possible. And thank you for joining me and for participating in this revision session. Remember to visit our website, learnextra.co.za forward slash live to get the notes and to watch the videos. If you are stuck on any questions, send an email to helpdesk at learnextra.co.za and tell us where you are stuck. All the best for your exams.